Good afternoon and welcome to NASDAQ Trade Talks. I'm your host, Jill Alandrino, Global Markets Reporter at NASDAQ. Joining me at market site is John Barton. He's the SVP of HNTB Corporation, and we are going to focus on the impact of self-driving cars on commerce. John, it's great to have you with me Thank at you, market site. Before we get into that, tell us a little bit about HNTB. So HNTB is an infrastructure solutions company. We do architecture and engineering work for a variety of clients around the country. We're a national organization, do very little international work, but uh, help public sector primarily clients uh, in the transportation space. So departments of transportation, airports, transit systems, toll authorities, those people that make mobility possible for all of us here in the U.S. Well, New York and New Jersey residents, we are very well aware of infrastructure concerns around our local area. If you go to self-driving cars, that's obviously going to have an impact because fuel taxes, I would imagine, derive a lot of that revenue for projects that we desperately need. Yeah, so as you think about automated vehicles and connected vehicles, smarter vehicles, there's a couple of things happening. The average combustion engine automobile has about 10,000 moving parts in it. The average uh, electric vehicle only has about 150 to 200. So a lot of these technologies are driving more towards electric vehicles because it's simpler to make the vehicles work through these autonomous systems. And because of that, clearly they're increasing the penetration of electric vehicles into the marketplace, which will drive down the consumption of fuel and therefore the fuel tax. So these technologies are very beneficial for improving mobility, making things safer because they'll avoid collisions, but they could lead to disruptions in the marketplace for the revenues available to build these transportation solutions we all need. Uh, as well as some of the things that we are used to today, such as um, auto repair shops, right. be disrupted by these. And it's interesting that you bring that up because it does have the trickle down effect even into local mom and pop shops, as you had said. Um, but then you also have to balance it out with, well, perhaps it's better for the environment as well. So it seems like a catch 22, no matter what you look at. Um, I think the other question is, and we were speaking about this earlier, Trump's one and a half trillion dollar infrastructure package. Is that even enough? to repair what we need? Well, it's clearly not. I think the president's been bold and make that projection mm -hmm. of how he would like to support infrastructure. Uh, the question always comes down to it, is it enough and how do you pay for these mm -hmm. things? What is the mechanism for collecting these revenues? The American Society of Civil Engineers puts out a report card about every four years on the, the condition of our nation's infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And year after year when they do these studies, they find that we haven't been investing enough here in the U.S. in our infrastructure and our needs far out uh, pace the revenues that are available. Right now, over a 10-year period, they project that we'll be $2 trillion short of the needed investments in infrastructure to really bring the condition of all of our infrastructure, transportation, water, energy, uh, up to a level that's acceptable in a A through F grading chart. So just to get it up to a C rating is uh, going to take a, a lot more revenue than we're currently generating. It's a shame the neglect that has been put onto our infrastructure system. So what's the solution? So, you know, as we think about solutions, I think something that we try to keep in mind up front is that when people talk about these things, they want to know who's going to pay for these. Mm -hmm. Well, at the end of the day, it's the consumer, right? It's, there's only two kinds of money, your money and my money. And so whether we pay that through taxes or tolls or fees at that fare box, it's coming from the citizens of the United States. So I think the questions that a lot of people are asking is, what's the appropriate way to collect that? Is it through user fees so that if somebody drives on a road or is on a transit system or flies an airplane that they're the ones paying for that benefit? Or is it part of the general economy and should we support it through general taxes that all of us are paying for the benefit of these types of systems to help our communities grow and prosper? Yeah, it's such a concern because we can't seem to agree on anything these days. And I would imagine we maybe have five, ten years before it really becomes into a point of disrepair. Is that accurate or is it something, I mean, is this something that we need to look at immediately? Well, every day it gets more critical. Right. Uh, because infrastructure is just like a human being. It gets older every day. Mm -hmm. And a lot of our infrastructure, whether that's the pipelines that support our petrochemical industries, our power system through electrical distribution grids, uh, roads and bridges, water and wastewater treatment facilities, sewer lines. All of those were built many, many years ago for mm -hmm. the most part and, and to a great extent have lived out their life and are actually beyond the anticipated life that they were designed for. So every day it gets more important. Um, I think that the United States is facing a, a very difficult decision. How much longer can we defer these reconstruction and maintenance activities? Uh, what kind of new materials can we bring to the solutions that help drive down cost and provide longer solutions? And most recently, how are we going to address these recurring 
storms that are more frequent and stronger and to build a more resilient system. And then of course, as things get smarter, there's the connectivity issues. So how do we do the cybersecurity work necessary to make sure that these new solutions as we build them out will be safe for us in the future and won't be vulnerable to an attack by someone that wants to harm us? I guess the bright side is, is a creation of jobs for these new industries that have to be supported. So if you look at you know STEM education and so forth, I guess that would be the bright side to it because it, all the different industries that you mentioned, there's a very specific skill set for that. There is, and so STEM programs within our elementary through uh, college education programs are critically important. Uh, we are not producing as many people with these new skill sets as we currently need, and so there is a lot of effort being placed on that. Uh, it is helping drive new economies and to even grow our existing economies. These improvements to infrastructure make uh, communities more successful. They create more efficiencies. Uh, if you think about the self-driving automated vehicles, which we were talking about earlier, at some point, if someone can ride in a vehicle rather than having to operate it, they'll be able to be connected, can do work, uh, can engage in entertainment, maybe uh, develop community around them, but they'll be able to do more production work while they're uh, traveling versus having to wait until they get to their office place or home. So there are improvements that these technologies are making to our economy. Uh, what we need to do is understand how to really facilitate those investments in our communities. And is that a local decision, a state decision, a national decision, or all of the above? Right. Well, thank you so much for joining us at Market Day. These, these are the kinds of issues that keep me up at night that I thank think you. about. All right, and thank you for joining me. I'm Jill Malandrino, Global Markets Reporter at NASDAQ.